Good morning. I'm honored to be here at this very powerful organization that goes right to the heart of the work I've spent doing over the last 50 years or so. The constructions of different forms of value-added shelter. I was asked to talk on density, and density has only real meaning if you start to put it against neighborhoods or cities. This is the age of cities. In the last hundred years, I'm sure you've heard this figure often, we've gone from 10% of the world living in cities to 50. We're looking very soon to go to 80%. Countries such as in England have 90% urbanization. It's about the third or fourth densest country in the world. We are seeing cities as the way forward in the development of man. Not least because climate change is a critical problem and that creates itself a certain limitation, a constraint. And I think it's good to have constraints, but this constraint we have to understand so as to beat it. I shall argue that the compact city, the city that has mix, live, work, leisure, poor and rich, that is, has great connectability, transportation infrastructure, that is well designed, that has good public space, that is ecologically sensitive. The, this, these cities are well within our, well, well, they're already within our portfolios practically. Some cities do it, and some cities are appalling at it. Now I say cities, I use cities a bit more like the Americans do, as covering all sorts of urban conglomerations. This is Masaccio, a painting by Masaccio in Florence. There are a number of reasons I put it there. One is it happens to be the city I was born in. Uh, secondly, because it's actually the first major painter of the early of the Renaissance, 1400s, with Brunelleschi. Um, he went, what it said, he went to Rome and rediscovered, in a way, the classical orders and the concept of painting in that manner. But really the reason I put it there, apart from being a great, great painting, it is typical of a city. It's a mix. It's not a ghetto. One of the problems we're having here, more and more the rich cut off from the poor. And one has to say, if there are two problems which are tearing the world apart, one is climate change, another is the big divide between poor and rich. And ghettoization is not the answer. You have to open the doors rather than close the doors. So here you see beggars, people, well-dressed, uh, and of course, the compact city, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I love Paris. One of my sons was born here, and this is a building that was born here, Santa Pompidou. Santa Pompidou is a big competition, and what we said to ourselves at first, I won't do this competition because it's going to be a monument. But perhaps the key point was when we decided that this scheme should be a cross between New York Times Square and the British Museum. This is a, here you have music, library and paintings, design. So it's a great big cultural centre. In fact, the next line was a place for all people, all ages, all creeds, for the poor and the rich. It's a sort of a cross between a fun palace and this place you could really study and admire what is being done in different ages, including contemporary times. It was tremendously difficult to build, not least because Renzo Piano and I, who had won the competition, there were 681 entries and we thought there'd be about 12. A slight miscalculation. And uh, we had very little experience. We had built more or less single-story buildings. And then suddenly we were faced with this massive building right in the center of Paris. And it was in the poorest area of the Marais. There used to be a, a brothel area being cleared up in the 30s, removing the buildings, not removing the, the brothels, which went one way sideways, showing that pr prostitutes are cleverer than politicians. And it has now become a true centre of, of the centre, it repaired the centre of Paris. So once, once it was open, it was embraced by the public. The compact city. This is Pienza, more or less the same time as the Masaccio. It's where I go and have my summer holidays, down in below, more or less, looking up. And it shows, first of all, what a green age does. In other words, it, uh, you're either in a city or you're in a country. You're not in a su suburb. So you can enjoy the best of both rather than watch your countryside be eroded. On the other hand, beautiful south of France, 
And here you see sprawl. Basically, there's nowhere you can go out. And this starts to use massive amounts of energy. To be exact, and we'll come back to this, sprawl uses about twice, two and a half times as much energy as compact, as well, of course, as land. The answer is towns in cities, not towns out of cities. There were very good reasons to have new towns in the early 20th century, from Ebenezer Howard onwards, because cities were so hellish. I should mention that 150 years ago, the average age of a worker in an industrial city was 17 years old. You could double that by moving into the countryside. Of course, everybody wanted to move into the countryside. At this point, we don't have that. We have actually a reverse situation. You're likely to live longer in the city than you are in the country. So Hamburg, below Barcelona, the left-hand side Barcelona, as it was 20, just before the Olympics, 20 years ago, and now as it is, beautifully developed. An infill which puts together and repairs the damage of industry and a bit of the war of that beautiful Barcelona city. And of course, Hamburg again, much the same. So I'm saying, don't have new towns. Milton Keynes, our perhaps most successful new town, immensely successful at that time. And well understand, I'm sure that I would have agreed to do, do it after the war with the soldiers coming back. We had to have a fast way of building, and Milton Keynes was the answer. And it's a good town. Though, again, there was a period of Milton Keynes blues, which I remember well. Because you mean you get into a town like this, all built at the same time, there's a tendency to have a lack of richness of overlapping. And not only this is activities, now it's a time. Buildings are great when you see different periods. And on the other side is Notting Hill Gate, high density by English standards, with beautiful gardens, a fantastic plan. Cambridge had done some really good work on land use, especially Leslie Martin, which showed that if you put buildings around public space, you could get very high density because you had fewer roads and, and, actually, and fewer corners, and you could actually get greater density by doing it as Notting Hill Gate in London. Barcelona is the most dense city in Europe. And as you'll see later on, it, it more or less competes with New York. It's nothing higher than eight stories. It depends on your planning. Barcelona also had a very clever idea, which is the Cedra plan, which is, this is Cedra was the planner architect who did this, chopped off the corners, unlike Washington, and it's on the corners of all the squares that you get all the activities, and it continues to be a great success. Two towns compared, one Barcelona and one Atlanta. What's interesting is the same size. They are absolutely the same size population. And just look at the land use. Now obviously the big sprawling town has serious car problems. Barcelona has very little car problems. Most people go by a bicycle or walk. They have very good bus transportation system, and it's very limited because it doesn't have to, be, have to sprawl. I think it's pretty clear which city is much more efficient, both in, both in climate change and in livability and the vitality. Cities brings vitality. Cities are both our economic engines and our cultural hearts of our cities. And I think Barcelona has it hands down. England has a massive amount of what we call brownfield, uh, land previously used. These are mainly docks. This is the East End. You could get half a million dwellings in the East End. And what we are saying, and I worked for the Mayor of London for a long time, brown first. Doesn't mean never touch green, but it means brown first. Use the derelict land first. You, otherwise, you just leave it as a mess, which is what it is here. Now, it is being built up, and all my children live in, that, in this part of London because it's the only place you can live, which is a critical part about London, of course. A lot of people now in our office can only afford to live to uh, work in London if they're willing to travel. 30 miles, not, not acceptable. This shows that the different ways that you can build buildings at the same density. If I remember rightly, it's 76 units per hectare. You can you have a single tower. You can have row houses, or you can have a cluster. That'll always give you the same density. So you have many options on how you plan. So you have, a, a, depending on what the site is, of course, and what you want to give, you have different ways of looking at it. There's not a good and a, or a bad, except obviously it's more difficult with tall buildings to create satisfactory ground levels. On the other hand, New York, where you have streets of tall buildings, work very well. Back to the East End. The Olympics has changed the East End immensely. 
cross rail transportation, we've suddenly re uh, realized that transportation is critical to link center of London, city, and so on, to the areas around. Here, as I said, there are about 400,000 dwellings we calculated you could put in, in this land. And we probably have nearly a half of that there now. So a lot of building is going in that area. Unfortunately, in my opinion, we're about to build a, I'm going to call it a new town, not far from here, where before we actually intensify the brown feel. If you have lots of empty houses, empty buildings in any area, it brings down the feeling of security. I remember well some years ago looking at Manchester, East Manchester, 15 years ago, um, where there was one out of every five houses was occupied, four were empty. You can imagine, night time, it wasn't much fun there. So intensification, retrofitting is part of our arms. Those two words, are well, I'll repeat them uh, later on, they're truly important. On the left is a sprawling city. On the right is a city built around transportation hubs. What we start by saying, if you put a bus, you have a 10 minute walking distance, as long as it's within that seven, probably seven minutes idea walking distance, you've got a, a serious infrastructure process. You then can get a train, the bus picks up trains, and so you build up, and that's an, a diagram of districts, neighborhoods, and city centers. And it's, sort of, it's obviously not a city, but it gives order to the city. That's extremely interesting figures. 81% of the population of Los Angeles go by car. More or less the same percentage in Tokyo go by tube. And in Manhattan, 45% of the people in Manhattan go by foot. This is a less known diagram. If you look at London, and this can be done in every city, I think, you find that there are lots of small hubs within the city, as well as the big neighborhoods. Now, London is very unusual in European terms, because London basically is built up of a number of boroughs, we'll call them 32 boroughs, coming together. So unlike Paris, which has one center, in the sense is the started at the islands, and it goes out like a tree, goes out in rings, and poverty is at the edges, and uh, wealth is at the center, London is more mixed, and I think that's a, a more sustainable, uh, and this is historical, a more sustainable way. But what it does do here, we picked up 600 hubs, all linked by public transport, all with one or two shops, maybe a small surgery, a nursery school, and so on. And we said, these are where you should be intensifying first, because there is life there already. Rather than pulling the town out, intensify in those areas. And if you look at a, this would be a typical hub, um, in, in Canning Town, and if you look at that and you think, I think, and we looked at this, you can probably put 500 apartments, flats, in this little houses and so on without any difficulty. And you think you've got 600, you've got a lot of housing there. So you need to use what you're already being given. And that intensifies the activities, makes work easier. It means you can walk to, walk to work, cycle to work, and even have efficient transportation systems. I put this Paris here partly because we're in Paris, but because my office is doing a big project for the president, which is called Le Grand Paris, it's very French. It's such confidence, I love it. <laughs> and it is really about, about what can we do with these big gashes in the cities, where the big railway, station, uh, uh, railway tracks come in, where the big stations are, uh, where the motorways are, how do we repair our communities, how do we look at it from the community point of view, which obviously means buildings as well. And this is a study, I shan't go through it now, but we've work, been working on it for some, for some time. Three cities compared in height gives you your density. What you, do, what you see is that basically, first of all, London is, is the lowest. Though it is changing so fast, I suspect if we did it now, uh, that map would be already very different. Um, London is going through, a, in that sense, a renaissance period, without doubt. I remind people that London, uh, when I started work, we all thought that London was going to be Frankfurt. Everybody was thinking about Frankfurt as the capital of Europe. Um, it has changed and has grown with it. Having said that, what this really says is that Berlin and London, as far as the number of people per hectare, is not much different. And Berlin is all low, more or less. London is medium. And of course, Berlin is spread out in comparison with New York City. So that just gives you a pattern. And that's really choice. That's not a good or a bad. It gives you choice. Depends how you do it. Again, I put this partly because our own buildings. We're just fin f finishing a building in Mexico City, million square feet. 
Uh, we finished the building in London. On the left hand side is Lloyd's of London, on the right what is now called the cheese grater where we have our office in. But what's interesting in it, if you get those who know Mexico, it must have some of the worst congestion anywhere. Our building for BBVA Bank has 3,000 cars in it, parked, a hell of a lot of space. Same size building in London has 10. That's regulations. That, now we don't have car parking for offices in central London. We haven't had it for years. I've never heard anyone complain. Certainly, um, someone should write about a, a little book on it because it's a real success story. This is an example. And of course, Singapore goes way further. Singapore is probably the city that got, has got itself together in the terms that I'm talking about more than any other city. And on, that's on the right, and just before I finish. It, on the right is a, I'm going to say, a molly typical plan of an office floor. Of course, this, these offices vary. The building slopes. Uh, this is the cheese grater. It slopes because it's a view of St. Paul's. So we have London is more or less controlled by views to historic monuments. Um, and it has to get out of the way, so it's getting out of the way. What we have done on, the, is, uh, on that building is given a tremendous public space at the ground level. We've lifted the building seven stories high, so there's a small piazza next door, and it just slips in underneath it. So there's a large public space, but also there are large floors on each one. Without a call, merely you put a call in the middle of the building, you are dictating to the person how to use it. In other words, if you've got an absolutely standard amount of space, there's four different areas on the four sides. I think, personally, it's dead. This is the, that way of rigid thinking should go. You need to find a way where everything is much more fluid. On well, the one that we put, which is one of the exam many ways of doing it, where we put a side core to the building, it gives that space for movement. And of course, flexibility is the critical element. And it's, it's critical, or it doesn't constrain the work, which must be the key part, but also the building should last longer, will be used longer, um, and that means sustainability. When we did Lloyd's on the opposite side, as I mentioned, you can just see it downstairs. Um, the brief on Lloyd's is 1980 about, uh, was we have, we've, we're not in the building business, but we've had to d pull down our buildings four times since the war. Um, that was because every damn building they built did not meet the changing situations. A diagram that shows in the middle, more or less, is the European city, the compact city. It, it talks about the amount of energy, the maximum amount of energy is the sprawling city, which of course tends to be the American city and also the oil countries, which have a lot of oil. Compact cities being in the middle and then you go on down there. Again, it is about social responsibility. The urban renaissance, the cities, the key parts that make that. We need to reclaim our, our streets are high streets. Many of them are run down. We need to build, mix, live, work, leisure, leisure, pull down the gates and build on brown sites, grow the transport network, protect the green belt and finally retrofit and intensify the localities, those 600 localities. These are things which will create a better city in the sense of principles. Again, they're not the design but they're principles. You know, good clients, and I said it yesterday, are critical to in any good work that we've done. If I look back, people say, which are your favorite works? Without uh, a thought, I know now that really all I have to do is to see which is the good clients. Those are the good jobs. I don't mean in financial, I'm talking about architectural. Finally, the living city. This is Copenhagen, one of the most sophisticated in terms of public spaces. Not a great weather, but you know, Copenhagen gives you blankets in the, in the, in the in the winter when you sit outside your cafe uh, so that you can warm up. The streets are a wonderful mix of cyclists and people and so on. It is very friendly and is in terms of the amount of energy it uses, it is extremely efficient, extremely efficient. And one more thing, and I'll just quote one of my favorite quotes. When the citizens of Athens were made citizens, 2,500 years ago, they had to swear, and the, and the oath goes, I shall leave the city more beautiful and more free than I entered it. Thank you very much.